Welcome to the Glenn Beck Program. I want to start with some audio from the wife of the Ground Zero Imam, Faisal Abdul Rauf. Her name is Daisy Khan, and here's what she said on TV this weekend about the opponents of the Ground Zero Mosque. Watch. I think we are uh, deeply concerned uh, because this is like a metastasized anti-Semitism. That's what we feel right now. It's, it's not even Islamophobia, it's beyond Islamophobia. It's hate of Muslims. All right, so now let me see if I have this right. Anyone opposed to the building of this mosque, it's just pure hatred of Muslims. It has nothing to do with a few questions, like where is the money coming from to build this mosque? Who is involved in this mosque? And where is her husband right now? Where is he? He's going around the world on your taxpayer dime doing outreach to Muslim countries. Basically, his job is to tell everyone how wonderful America is. May I ask a question? Am I the only man in America that's married to a, to a woman where we'd have these conversations? How is it possible when his wife is saying that this is all hatred against Muslims in America, can someone ask a common sense question? Have these two chatted recently? Has the conversation not popped up in the Abdul Rauf household? What is he saying over there? Wouldn't it be kind of an important thing to sort out before we send this guy around the world as an ambassador to the United States? If this is what his wife is saying about America here in America, what is he saying to, about America to others around the world? And I'm sorry if it sounds a little paranoid, but there are radical, uh, radicalized Muslims who would like to kill everybody in America and destroy the Western way of life. So we're a little sensitive on the topic. Something doesn't add up here. Let me ask you this question. If you were an ambassador and you were going around talking up America and saying how great it is for you and people like you, and your wife went on ABC television and said, well, this is just straight up hatred for all Muslims, would you at least send her a text? No, no. In today's America, you'd just be called a hate monger for even considering it. Hello, America. Coming to you from the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., all week. Um, we are getting ready to do the 828 event at the uh, Lincoln Memorial this coming Saturday, and it is all about this, the Purple Heart, but it wasn't what it is now. When George Washington first gave this, he gave this to the common everyday guy for doing something of honor and merit. We must restore honor to be able to fix ourselves. We'll give you more information on that as the week continues and a little more tonight. But every time I'm here in Washington, D.C., I can't help but feel the history. Last night I was in Mount Vernon, and if you're coming to Washington, D.C., you must send your kids to Mount Vernon. You must go with them. It is the best museum, I think, in the city. Um, not a single government dime been spent on it, and that's why it's so good. They did it right. When you're here in the city, you can't help but reflect on the founders and the miracle that is America. But sometimes I wonder, by the actions here in this city, if they feel the same way. I don't think a lot of people here have the same level of appreciation for the city. In fact, it seems quite the opposite. There are many in this city now that want to undo everything and fundamentally transform America. They're doing it in several different ways, but tonight, for a few minutes, I just want to concentrate on the mosque and our current stance on Israel. We are taking a friendship that is really our only like-minded friend in the Middle East, and we are flushing it down the drain. So, you know, 10 years ago, I was probably an awful lot like you. Um, I mean, we were schlubs 10 years ago when it came to what we knew about the Middle East, most of us, and at least I was. 10 years ago, I would have read this news about what's going on and go, oh, gee, the Arabs and the Jews are fighting, and the Jews and the Arabs are fighting. <laughs> I wonder what Garfield and Odie are up to today. I wouldn't have known anything that was going on in the Middle East, nor did I care. Then 9-11 happened, and we had to care. I went and I did my homework. I got onto a plane even with my wife, and we went overseas. I wanted to see things firsthand. I wanted to have some sort of understanding if I was going to talk to America about it. 
If I was going to be a responsible adult and parent, I had to understand it. If you haven't done your homework yet, what is it going to take? I urge you to catch up on it and catch up on it fast. It's kind of important for a couple of reasons. One, ah, uh, the whole end of time thing and the tiny dependency on foreign oil detail. We must, as a country, as citizens, forget about your represent, uh, representation in Washington. Do you think they represent you anymore? This is your country. You have to understand it. You lead the way. What is coming our way is not good. I hope I'm wrong on this, but I think there is a bad conflict coming our way soon in the Middle East. And it's been going on for thousands of years, but it matters to all of us in America today. Here is the latest from just this weekend. Israel has called up the fueling of the Iran nuclear power plant, totally unacceptable, and they are practically begging the international community to apply some pressure on Iran to stop any uranium enrichment. It's not going to happen. The time to do this was years ago under Bush, but he didn't do it either. Why? Well, some people like me thought we should have put pressure and help to the people in Iran because an airstrike isn't going to be good. But does Israel have a right to do it? Would we do it? If we were sitting in their position and Canada was doing what Iran is doing, do you think we'd strike Canada? Do you think people would be clamoring for it? Especially if the Canadian Prime Minister came out and said what President Ahmoud, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad has said, he denies the Holocaust and then calls for Israel to be wiped off the map. Can you imagine sitting there and doing nothing if that's what Canada said about America and then said that they would burn in the fires of the Islamic fury? I don't know. I think Israel might have an understandable position here. Right now they're calling for help, but the options are dwindling because we're wasting time. Where does our administration stand on the issue? I'm not really even sure. The powering up of the nuke plant gets a shrug of the shoulders. Ha! Huh, we're just seeing that one coming. Maintaining now that the plant is not a proliferation risk. How? How exactly? You feel better? So now you have the tension building. You have Israel with fewer and fewer friends. And that includes, I believe, us, unfortunately. That increases the likelihood that Israel... Jews have a right to live. Israel and Jews have a right to live. What do you think they're going to do? What would you do? They're going to take the plant out. Now you have the Israelis informing the United Nations that they're going to use force to stop the new aid flotilla that reached the uh, blockaded Gaza Strip. They said, this time we're going in. What would you do? Wouldn't you? I mean, let, let, let's play this out. If you could even get Jimmy Carter, because, I mean, he was, he's a man of peace. If you could get G Jimmy Carter to put the peanut farm down for a second and draft another wonderful peace agreement that was so good the first time, does anyone believe that that would last? Do you really think in our arrogance that we can miraculously get these two sides together that have fought for 5,000 years to suddenly stop and go, you know what? <laughs> we just gotta, we just gotta get together and have snacks. And whose side are we on? Brzezinski, he's the guy who was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor. He said just last year that not only should Obama not support an Israeli strike on Iran's nuclear sites, and I want to be very clear, that's insane. To strike is insane. To not strike is insane. That's why I said five years ago, we're going to be backed into a corner, and it's not going to be good. But he said, to stop them, we should actually shoot down Israeli jets if they try to do so. Here's how he responded to a question of how aggressive Obama should be in the case of an Israeli airstrike. Brzezinski, quote, we're not exactly impotent little babies. They have to fly over our airspace in Iraq. We're just going to sit there and watch? The interviewer then asks, quote, what if they fly over anyway? Brzezinski, well, we have to be serious about denying them the right. And that means a denial where you aren't just saying it. If they fly over, you have to go up and confront them. So the United States would confront Israeli jets. By the way, did anybody notice that we, 
We didn't pull our troops out of Iraq. We just changed the names. Did you know that? We changed the names. What happens if the Middle East melts down? What does that mean to our troops? What does that mean to the peace in Iran, uh, uh, in Iraq? Aren't we in the middle of it again? So here we have Jimmy Carter's national security advisor suggesting that we defend Iran instead of Israel when a confrontation happens. That's the kind of thinking that permeates this current administration. The president also has a long record. He has said during his Cairo speech to the Muslim world that, yeah, denying the Holocaust is bad, but... On the other hand, it is also undeniable that the Palestinian people, Muslims and Christians, has suffered in pursuit of a homeland. For more than 60 years, they've endured the pain of dislocation. Boy, I wish somebody would read a history book from time to time. And then, let's see, six million slaughtered or dislocation. Not really seeing the parallel here, but thanks for stopping by. After the first flotilla incident, the administration announced that it would be supporting a U.N. resolution against Israel. So you know, America, that's never happened before. This coming from a guy who sat in the pew of a church. President Obama spent 20 years, called the pastor of this church a great man, who said this, Israel is a dirty word. Listen. Last year's conference in Africa on racism, which the United States would not participate in because somebody dared to point out the racism which still supports both here and in Israel. I said that dirty word again. Every time you say Israel, Negroes get awfully quiet on you because they scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. You don't see the connection between 91101 and the Israeli Palestinian? Something wrong. You want to buy my glasses? This is the guy who doesn't talk to the president anymore because he says the Jews control him now. The president has close ties. He has close ties to people that you and I would not have close ties to. He has nothing but kind, kind things to say about terrorist sympathizer Rashid Khalidi. He also has ties with anti-Israel flotilla organizers Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers. The deputy national security advisor for DHS, John Brennan, insulted Israel by using the phrase Al-Quds. What is Al-Quds? That's the Arab name for Jerusalem, which Israelis find offensive. Another Obama advisor. General James Jones openly making anti-Semitic jokes. The president himself dumped Benjamin Netanyahu so he could have dinner in private. That's, uh, that's, uh, I've, I've never heard of that happening before. I've never heard the president doing that to any foreign visitor. And here's the latest. We found out this weekend the social...